It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my very special guest is Ted Fleming, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Develop Seven Practical Tools to Take Charge of Your Career. Ted, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, Ted, this is the very first time you and I are meeting today. I know you're going to be brand new to many of my viewers, many of my listeners. So we're going to kick off this conversation by having you share a bit of the Ted Fleming origin story for all of us meeting you for the first time today. What superpowers do you have? What special abilities? What do we need to know about you? Well, thanks. Uh, I basically uh, come from a family of uh, teachers and preachers. That's what we always say in my uh, family and at the family reunion. So, you know, mother, uh, aunts, uncles are all teachers and on my mother's side, lots of ministers. So uh, I started out substitute teaching, long-term substitute teaching. Uh, Then after that, uh, went into uh, banking then healthcare, or then was on my own for for a little bit, and uh, then went uh, back to uh, healthcare. So that's kind of my my quick uh, story. But the thread in all of those is I've always enjoyed uh, counseling people, advising people, and helping them be their best selves. Well, you know, I, I think from our older generations, you often stayed at one company forever. You might have had a range of jobs, but you were a company man. You were there for 40 years or until you retired. Um, I I know I'm a Gen Xer. I know for my generation and coming up in the tech industry, I've had like a bazillion jobs. And so I'd be curious to hear for you in terms of motivation for kind of career jumping, company hopping, like what were you looking for? For me, I get bored and I like to learn new things or I I get to like a ceiling or like, I I can't learn much more here. So I'm, I'm always wanting to learn. So I'm curious to hear what was your motivation for so many shifts? So I think the motivation for my shifts is I was lucky enough to find out what I was good at fairly young in my career. And what I really enjoyed was I really enjoyed turning things around. If something was broken, I liked fixing it. And I liked the sort of blue sky thinking. If if it didn't exist before, I wanted to start it. And so I was comfortable with a lot of ambiguity or I was comfortable jumping into problems and fixing things. And so so when I look across my career, that's what I've done. And if if that describes your career, what you'll find is you'll change jobs, change industries, change companies, because you're looking for a situation as opposed to just a company. And I want to pull a little bit more on that thread of kind of that role of advisor, which is consistently seen uh, throughout the the many hats you've worn, we might say. Is that something you maybe saw growing up? I mean, you said you come from a long line of preachers and teachers, which uh, folks in those roles tend to want to help people. So was that modeled for you or is it just something you discovered that you really enjoyed or maybe both? It was a little bit of both, but it was certainly modeled for me. I mean, what I learned is I didn't recognize all the skills I was learning as a teacher, you know, as a, as a teacher and coming from a family with lots of teachers, what do they do? They, they have a lesson plan. They have something they want to impart upon a group of people. And what they're really great at is breaking down complex systems or solutions into piece parts and then teaching it to people so that they get it. And they also are good at treating people as individuals, right? What may work for one person won't work for another. So they're very adaptable. And so between that and the listening skills, of course, of uh, uh, preachers and and, and folks in uh, church settings, those two skills combined where you become a good advisor. Well, we've heard a little bit of your backstory. Let's transition now into a little bit of the story behind the book. My whole world is full of authors and talking about books that are coming to life. So I always feel like there's kind of a timing, a fullness, maybe a percolating and bubbling up. So I always like to hear uh, for you, why was this the right time for this book to come to life and, and go out into the marketplace? Right. For me, uh, I would have never told you I, I was going to write a book, it, but I have worked with thousands of clients, and I would say over the past three years, I kept hearing, well, when are you going to write a book? 
when are you going to write a book? And I was like, why, why would I write a book? Who, who, who wants to read my book? And basically, my clients encouraged me. And, I, and then I started asking them questions. Well, well, why would I write a book? I was like quizzing them. And what they said to me was, well, your approach is different. The advice you've given me is clear. Uh, you're giving me step-by-step -step instructions. And it's been very effective. Uh, and so I tease a good friend of mine, Jen Graham. She finally just said, okay, we're going to make this happen. And for a Christmas gift, she just gave me a book that said how to write a book proposal and get your book published. So <laughs> I took that as a sign. And from there, the journey has been uh, quite rapid to uh, writing a book. Well, and I, I, one, one more question related to the backstory of the book. What, what was the hardest thing or biggest challenge you had to overcome as a first time author? As a first-time author, uh, I'm used to being very brief. Again, going back to the teaching, not uh, long-winded. So I think uh, my first draft of the book was probably a quarter of the size of what uh, it ended up being. And as my wife often tells me, she goes, you, you need to give examples so people know. So you can't just give them the headline. You have to give them some examples. So uh, that was the biggest challenge for me. Well, and see, you erred often in the direction most authors don't go. Uh, many authors, their word count's way too high. I mean, we, we've had manuscripts come in that are over 100,000 words. We're like, this is like enough for two and a half books, not one book. So that's interesting. Most people wouldn't go in that direction. But uh, if, if that's just how you tend to communicate, it completely makes sense. Right. Uh, well, well let's, trans uh, let's transition now into some of the meat of what you cover in the book. Um, I really believe one of the hardest things for people in terms of thinking about job exploration, whether that's within their own company or looking out towards other organizations is just taking that, that first step, giving themselves permission, being willing to, being ready to explore. And one of the things I really appreciate that you cover in chapter one is asking people to really start thinking about as they look to the future, what is it that motivates them? What is it that makes them happy? You know, I think uh, on the outset, people are like, well, I, I want to make more money and this or that. But often I've found through the years, money isn't at all what motivates people or making, makes them happy. It's nice to have, but often it's those intangible things that really bring that big job satisfaction, what we're looking for. So uh, in terms of the ground you cover in chapter one, what are some of the surprising things people discover along the way? We're like, oh, I didn't even realize that motivated me or got me excited. Right. What I find, and you're absolutely right, it's something people often feel that jobs are something I have to have. And so they, they just focus on the money or they just focus on the location. But when you actually speak with people and say, what makes you truly, deeply happy? It's these motivators that we're talking about. And so I try to get people to pause and think about that. And in the book, I talk about two different uh, types, which is the must-haves, sort of what must you have in order to uh, be happy with a particular job? And then what are the things that truly make you uh, motivated and happy? And so I give people a list. We go back and forth. They will often think about it, come back and change what's on that list. But uh, from a practical point of view, what we're really doing is we're trying to uncover the culture that results in you being happy and successful. Well, next, let's talk about the importance of mapping of experiences. Now, uh, as, as a manager of people, and just I've got lots of friends that I've kind of encouraged and coached through the years, I found that this was another stumbling block where they're like, well, I want to jump into this new industry, but I don't have any experience that's relevant. I look at the job description, and there's nothing. And so, you know, I, I've, I think of the hours I've sent, uh, spent sitting down, it's like, all right, well, let's, what do you do here? Oh, you did this project? Well, that actually fits exactly. But people just don't see it. They need uh, almost like a, a, a dotted lines drawn so they can see how what they've done here relates to what they're going to potentially do over there. So uh, talk to us about mapping experiences. Why is that important? And how can that, I, I think even in some ways, it, it, it makes us feel empowered that we are the person for that other role or that other organization. Right. So in mapping your experience, what, what we find, and this is a, uh, everyone does this, it's a natural tendency. The more you work in the same company or same area or organization, you start to speak the lingo. You start to speak the jargon. Each um, 
each area has its own language. So the problem arises when you're trying to communicate with people what you can do to someone who's not from that particular area. So I find that the mapping experience exercise helps. So what you what I ask people to do is just take any resume accomplishment that they have. This is also helpful because most people don't write down their accomplishments and then they're looking back 10 years and saying, now what did I do back then? So, you know, in the book I talk about, let's say you're just a salesperson and you've increased sales by say 15%. What I want you to do is that's the accomplishment, but break that down. What were the actual transferable skills that allowed you to be a successful salesperson? And it might be communication skills, it might be presentation skills, it might be writing or analytical skills. These skills are transferable to lots of different jobs. But if you lead with just, well, I was a salesperson, no one's ever gonna consider you for marketing or publicity or whatever. And so that's the first step. And then the second step is, what are the key milestones? What is it that you actually did? And you have to be able to tell that story so people get both, they understand your skills and they understand what you have done. And then when you combine those, you're able to communicate much more clearly and identify future opportunities. Well, a dirty little secret when it comes to sales and marketing and advertising, there, there's a lot of overlap with those roles. I'll just, I'll just say that as a guy who's been in marketing for quite a while. Uh, next, let's talk about everybody's absolute favorite topic, networking. Now, I, I'm an introvert, but uh, you know, I have to get out there. My whole world revolves around networking and meeting people and connecting other people. Uh, for some people, they're like, oh, dear God, I don't want to have to do networking. Um, but I feel like where people often get frustrated is they'll spend way too much time in the wrong kinds of networking or just networking in the wrong places. And one of the things that I found really helpful that you cover in the book is kind of breaking up the networking group, so to speak, that we're a part of into four quadrants and making sure that we're percentage wise investing the right amount of time, effort and resources in places that are actually going to make a difference, places that are going to bring the success we're looking for in terms of our goals and what we're moving towards. Uh, so talk to us about kind of, kind of the power of networking if we divide our time and effort appropriately? Yeah, this is a very important topic. And, and especially uh, now we know from research that the majority of people get their jobs through networking, okay? They're not getting them from a newspaper or an online service or something like that. So networking is important. So what I tell people is you got to network the right way. And what I stress is there's four conditions for people to hire you. They've got to know you. They've got to like you. They've got to know your work and like your work. And so by combining those four elements, I came up with the networking quadrant uh, along with a friend of mine, Bill Varnell. And so what you have is there's peer networking, right? Those are people that... Uh, know and like your work, but they may not know you quite well, right? Often these can be people that have worked beside you for a number of years, but they don't know about your family. They don't know if you have 10 kids or not. They don't know, uh, you, know, where you you know where you live and what you do on your free time. So what in that group, you want them to get to know you as a person. And once they're comfortable with you, they're going to share their network. Another quadrant is the clients, right? Those are people that know you and like you, know your work and like your work. For those people, they already love what you do and they like you. So be straight with them. What is it you're looking for? I see way too many people taking their, their clients and their best friends out to lunches and coffees and all. You don't need to do that. They're, they're already in your corner. There's a social, right? The social network, those are folks at uh, church, folks at school, uh, you know, your friends that are on teams. They love you, but they don't know what you do. So what you have to do is you have to spend time with them and say, here's what I'm interested in. Here's what I'm willing to explore. Is there anyone in your network that can help me? And then you can do the same for them. And then finally, there's the traditional networking, which is why we all hate it. I don't know you, you don't know me, and we're, we're going to pretend that we have this relationship. 
So what I tell people is you're only going to spend 10% of your time. And if you're going to bother to put all the time and effort into getting to know someone that doesn't know you, they better be what I call a wow contact. Meaning if you do develop this relationship, they can make your dreams come true. And I also, as an introvert, when I show them that, uh, this networking quadrant, look, you're talking to your friends, you're talking to your relatives, and you're talking to people that know you at work. The majority of your networking will be with people you know. Well, and I think uh, you've identified one of those pain points, which is that kind of networking with strangers, you know, the days of giving out 250 business cards at an event and that bringing any kind of noticeable return, those, those days are, that's like, you know, 30 years ago. So if that scares you, it scares all of us. It's not really helpful or effective. Uh, and one other comment I would have about networking too is as you're looking for opportunities that are higher up the, the ladder, so to speak, um, I, I could, if I look back in the past, you know, five to 10 years of my career, the opportunities I've gotten that have been huge opportunities and big shifts, it's because I've known people in the industry, people that I've been friends where I've poured into and collaborated with them on something we don't necessarily work together. Um, but it's those relationships that open the door. Like they think if I have this opportunity, oh my gosh, Ted, Sean, they're the guys I want doing this thing. And so people will actually start to seek you out at certain points. Like we really think you'd be the right guy for that. So if you're, if you're dreaming of big things, uh, you know, people always say it's who you know. Well, it, it kind of makes a difference. It absolutely does. And that's the connection. You get that, your job exploration summary, you tell people what you're looking for, what you're willing to explore, and you combine that with your network, and that's where the power comes in. Well, let's talk about another favorite topic for everybody, and that is actually making a plan. I feel like so many of us, we get all excited and we start going after something, and we're like, oh, I didn't really come up with a plan. And that's one of the important things that you uh, covering the book is creating a, a well thought out development plan. I think you describe it as a literal blueprint for success. So we're, we're working through all the tools and we're knocking out all the exercises and then you're like, all right, time for a development plan. Why is that important? Well, it's important no matter what. Um, let's take the situation where you, you love your job, you want to stay in your job, you have no desire to move. In that case, you still need a plan because we know that over time, jobs become more complex. They evolve over time. And so the same job that you're doing today won't be the same job, even if you don't move seats five years from now. So it's important there. And then it's also important to have a development plan if you do want to move up or change industries or get promoted. So what I tell people is your plan should be really have a few parts. So one is the work plan. And again, I want to make it very simple, which is what experiences, job experiences will you have over the next 12 months? And you just write those down. Second is your learning plan. What are you going to learn that's new over the next 12 months? Are you going to, you know, are you going to read a book? Are you going to work with uh, someone else to learn a new skill? The third is the mentor plan. So who are you going to work with to help develop an existing strength or to address maybe a weakness that you have or learn a new skill? And the final is the life plan, which is what uh, many people ignore, which is we can learn an awful lot from outside the four walls of our cube or now sitting at home <laughs> or the office, which is what can we learn from our community experiences? What can we learn from hobbies? What can we learn from maybe some nonprofit work that we're doing? And when you put all those together, you're building your networks and building your skills. One thing that I was also excited about is you don't just stop with part one of the book. I think a lot of books in the space your book is in would just have stopped with section one and that would have been it. But you get into uh, some special circumstances in the latter part of the book. So I want to make sure that we talk about both of those. Uh, you have a chapter on making transitions, moving from one industry to another. That's something that's been a huge part of your career. As I've said, it's been part of my career. W what are some things we need to think about if we're looking to jump industries? Well, the, the analogy I use is it's like learning a new language. So if you want to jump from one industry to another, and we alluded to it 
earlier in our conversation. Uh, it, you know, you've got to you've got to learn the new jargon, right? You got you got to learn the new terminology. And so, uh, I, when I learned languages at at college, they had they, they used what we call the Rossius method. So we you know, we went to class, and there was that that class. Then there was drills where you, you had these tutors only speaking the language, and and we would go back and forth. And then there was a lab where we would actually listen to native uh, speakers. And so I use that as a blueprint for making transitions. So in other words, what you've got to do is you've got to have maybe some formal learning, like a professor to tell you what's this industry about, what are the skills, knowledge, and experiences you need. Second, you need some drills. It's good to talk to someone and try to speak the new language of the industry. Let's say you wanted to speak media and entertainment about podcasts. Okay, I'm gonna talk about how to put together a podcast. And even though I don't know a lot about it, you're just gonna let me talk about it. And then at the end, you're gonna say, okay, here's the parts you missed, or here's what you're not understanding. And then finally, what you wanna do is you wanna listen for whatever industry you're interested in to native people, right? People that are experts in the field and let's see how they talk. And in the beginning, you might understand 40, 50% of what they're saying, but after a while, you'll get it. I find this often in finance. You know, I'll tell people, listen to an earnings call or listen to um, people talking on a finance show or, or, or a uh, business program. How much of it did you understand? And so over time, what happens is you'll learn a new language, you'll understand the experiences you need, and you'll then be able to tell the gaps between your experience and what you need. And then we go back to that mapping exercise that we talked about earlier, and you talk about how your skills are transferable to the new area. And let's wrap up the conversation, Ted, by having you talk about breaking barriers. How can we overcome very, there are very, various kind of bar barriers we might have to break depending on the circumstances. So how do we overcome those sorts of challenges we're encountering in the workplace? Yeah, in the book I focus, there are lots of, well, first of all, it's anyone that's on the, anyone that's in the uh, minority. So if you work in a firm full of engineers and you're the marketing, you're going to feel like you're on the outside. But in the book, I talk about barriers in particular that uh, women and people of color face. And so uh, what you want to do is there's some typical barriers. One is access, right? So what I call it access to the engines of the organization. And what you want to analyze is where does the organization make money? What drives profits? And you want to be able to understand that part of the business and get access to that part of the business. The other is real feedback, right? You want to understand, you want unvarnished feedback. How am I really doing? What do I need to do in order to move ahead? Networking is even more important so that you need people to bring you along. Uh, and so I think those are, I cover more, but I think those are, those are the big ones. And I, you just know you're not alone and you may have to network outside of your area to find advice to help people uh, move or break through the barriers, but uh, it can be done. Well, and, and I'll say too, in terms of not just working kind of in your own business unit, the more people you know throughout the organization, um, you know, just like if you're looking to move into a different organization, it's those other people that you're in relationship with that open doors that might invite you to come along. Uh, you know, I, I've found people are going to be excited that you're interested to find out what they do because, you know, they're, they're just as siloed as you are sometimes. And when somebody shows enthusiasm for your area of the company, uh, you might have just made a new friend. So just like networking is helpful outside the organization, it is just as critical inside the organization. Uh, Ted, as you think of the reader's journey with the book, uh, they, they get to that last page, they close that back flap. How do you hope you've empowered, impacted, encouraged them along the way? Yeah, I, I hope that I have given people simple, relevant, and easy to apply tools for either growing in their existing role or finding a next opportunity. And so my hope is 
that I can replicate uh, virtually that advisor role that I've done with thousands of clients and they feel like they're not alone um, and they can deal with their frustration and actually have a blueprint for getting a job that makes them happy. And Ted, anything I've failed to ask you, something that you want to be sure, like, hey, Sean, we need to make sure this fits into the interview. Uh, the only quick thing I'll say that's related uh, across all of them is the power of image, which is you, you want to manage your, your image. It's what speaks when you're not in the room. It's what you alluded to, Sean, when you were talking about uh, other folks in your network speaking up for you. Because you're not in the room when they give you a promotion, decide your base pay, you know, any of those uh, put you on a special project. So having a good, strong image and having people speak up on your behalf is important. And Ted, for the listeners, the viewers who want to connect with you, find out more about the book, where can we find you on the web? Thanks. It's uh, tedfleming.com. Uh, you can go there and take my leadership survey. You can see um, my blog posts and other videos and um, we can connect. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Ted and pick up your very own copy of his brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Ted Fleming. Once again, our book today was Develop, Seven Practical Tools to Take Charge of Your Career. For more on Ted and the book, head on over to his website. Once again, you can find that at tedfleming.com. And Ted, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Likewise.